The House of Mystery presents Inside Writing, the radio show where authors discuss their writing process in all genres. Welcome back into the House of Mystery. I'm Al Warren. Mr. Michael Hawley is here. Hello, Al. Hey, you just barely made it. Oh, yeah. It was it was a close call, but uh, I got a substitute, so I got to be here. Yeah, and what's this? Now, I keep seeing pictures of six feet of snow in Buffalo. Oh, in yeah, Buffalo. not anymore. Most of it's melted, but uh, in the south towns of Buffalo, it was uh, we got the lake effect, and people don't understand what lake effect is until they live near one of the Great Lakes, and it was truly six feet of snow over the weekend. Yeah, yeah. But you got, you don't stay cold there, so it goes away, doesn't it? Uh, right now, I think most of it's been melted. Yeah, uh, it's we're around forty degrees. We'll get to below freezing a little bit in, uh, at the beginning of December. But yeah, it's doesn't get as cold as like uh, when you go in the center, you know, like yeah. Minnesota or something. Right, right. So same, it's the same around our lake here too, right? And you get it, and then it it kind of melts off. So it's it's, it's kind of good in a sense. And, oh, and you've got your big truck, hey? Big truck. Oh yeah, my brand new truck. You betcha. <laughs> <laughs> it's the big, the big man truck. <laughs> yeah, I'm a truck owner now. <laughs> okay, well, today we are going back, like just like we were doing this last week and a couple other weeks, we, we cover, and you're good with this, you're Mr. Jack the Ripper. So. Oh, yes, I love it. Uh, I'm excited to talk to Richard. Yeah, so we're going to be talking to a lifelong Sherlockian. And uh, this time we have Mr. Richard T. Ryan. So uh, welcome to the show, Richard. Hey, Al. Thank you. Thank you for having me. Nice speaking with you. Nice to see you too, Michael. Well, Richard, I have to. I, I, I always wonder where one begins this journey of being a lifelong Sherlockian. So this is from the get-go? Uh, I actually... Uh, discovered Sherlock Holmes and began to take him seriously when I was a graduate student at the University of Notre Dame. And uh, I, you know, I, I've delved into it. I, I've read the entire canon several times over, but it began at Notre Dame. And then back in the 80s, I wrote a Sherlock Holmes trivia book. And uh, then I was getting ready to retire from the newspaper industry. I'd worked 30 years as a newspaper man, and I'd always wanted to write a book. And uh, Sherlock Holmes just seemed like a natural. What is it about Sherlock Holmes that is so um, fascinating to you that keeps you um, involved in it for so many years? Well, I think, I think you have a character that's not a superhero. You know, he's, he's a normal... You know, everyday individual, obviously a lot smarter than most people. And it's the creation and the way he uses his mental abilities and the partnership with Watson that are all endearing facets, you know, of this character and his relationship with his, you know, with his best friend. Do you, do you like that, the, um, the way that uh, different places you know, uh, television and movies and, and sometimes writers um, change who Sherlock Holmes is and even Watson. Yeah, I, I'm not averse to it. It was one of my favorite TV shows was Elementary with, you know, Johnny Lee Miller playing Holmes as a recovering drug addict, which he kind of is in the Doyle novels. Obviously, they took the uh, the liberty of turning Watson into a woman, which I'm fine with. Uh you know, there's a uh, there's a million different permutations of Sherlock Holmes, and my own gut feeling is that the analogy I always use is like a coloring book. You know, I I don't care what colors you use, but I would like you to stay within the line. Yeah. So when they when they take Holmes to the extremes, uh, that's something I'm not comfortable with. That's something I'm not fond of, but. As long as it's a recognizable Holmes on the page and a recognizable Watson on the page. I mean, I'm, I'm fond of the Benedict Cumberbatch series. I have no problems with moving it up to contemporary times, you know. But there are certain, you know, if, if you're going to do Holmes, then do Holmes. Don't do your version of Holmes. Do Doyle's version of Holmes. Yeah. Well, there's something about it. And, and the actual mystery in each book 
um, the case that each one of it covers. Um, do you find it to be quite unique as far as mystery writing? Well, Doyle was was a master of style, and that's one of the things that I think a lot of people don't appreciate is, you know, all his novels. He wrote four novels, and they're all relatively short. Three of them might even be considered novellas. The longest one is The Hound of the Basketball, is about 60,000 words. But, I mean, he's got, a no, he's got one that's 42,000 words, 43,000 words, 49,000 words. So, I mean, they're, they're short. And he does in one or two sentences what other authors need to take one or two paragraphs to do. You know, he, he, was, he, was, he was Hemingway before Hemingway knew how to write that way. So what, what is that to you? When you're in the position of of being involved in a writing, you know, Sherlock Holmes cases. Well, the first book I wrote was called The Vatican Cameos. And uh, what I did in that book, in two of the Sherlock Holmes novels, um, they're bipartite. The whole first half of the novel is Sherlock Holmes solving the mystery. And then the second half of the novel is the villain, if you will, giving us his backstory, and then Holmes comes in at the end for the denouement. Uh, what I did in the, in the first book was I set all the odd chapters in uh, the 1890s, 1901, I believe it was, and all the even chapters in 1501. And, you know, I had people saying, this is not a Holmes book. He's only in it for half the book. Well, yeah, but if you look at, you know, the sign of four, he's only in it for half the book. If you look at it for a study in Scarlet, he's only in it for half the book. But the thing that came out of that, where I was getting back to, was a very prominent uh, Sherlockian, whom I respect a great deal, liked the book, and he said, you know, it, it's, it's similar to Doyle's in many respects. He says, the only thing is, if you're going to do Doyle, he says, you know, go with him in length as well. So the next six books I've written have all been rather short. They're in that Doylean range of fifty to 60,000 words. So, I, you know, imitation is a sincerest form of flattery, and I try to imitate Doyle in all aspects. How does one become what you do? Uh, you know, like, is there like a, a certain test? Is there a certain um, procedure that you've got to go through before you write stories like Sherlock Holmes stories? No, I, I think... The thing you have to do, if you, if you want to write a Sherlock Holmes story, because he is in public domain, and you, you certainly can use him as a character. Uh, but the thing is, you, you have to immerse yourself in what's called the canon, the 56 short stories and the four novels. You know, you, you, you have to basically know that cold, because Sherlockians are a very discerning audience, and they will call you out on even what they perceive to be the most minute slip. So half of the time I spend when I'm doing a book is spent in research because the details all have to be right. Richard, um, I, I wanted to be part of this because uh, about a month and a half ago, I did a, a lecture, a local lecture. Uh, I, I, I researched Jack the Ripper, but uh, I did a mutual lecture with a, our local um, Sherlock Holmes expert Kevin Gallivan, and uh, and so his group, uh, they so we were speaking together, and the question was always, uh, if uh, one question was, is why did uh, Arthur Conan Doyle not have um, Sherlock Holmes go after Jack the Ripper? But the question was, is if he would, uh, all those kind of questions between you know uh, the fiction, the fictional person of uh, Sherlock Holmes versus the nonfiction of Jack the Ripper. So I was curious about that because yeah, what I was surprised at is that uh, Arthur Conan Doyle did not uh, have um, uh, Sherlock Holmes kind of go against Jack the Ripper. Uh, any thoughts on that? Uh, as you can imagine, I've read several uh, Holmes and Ripper uh, encounters, for lack of a better word. And uh, I'm, I'm, I'm starting to think... You know, the, the more theories that we get about Jack the Ripper, you can correct me if I'm wrong on this. You know, there were a number of people that seemed to think that in some way, somehow, the royal family was involved with the Jack the Ripper killings. Yes. You know, and there was a book uh, many years ago called Prince Jack, 
uh, that I have downstairs. But I'm almost wondering if Doyle just deliberately stayed away from it so as not to, A, bring any more attention to it than it had already attracted, and B, because somewhere, somehow, it might end up embarrassing, you know, the Victoria and the royal family at that time. Yeah, that could be. I, I, I did discover, find uh, when Arthur Conan Doyle was in Boston, and uh, a, a reporter asked him uh, in 1894, uh, what would uh, the uh, Sherlock Holmes have done to Jack the Ripper? And, and so it was Arthur Conan Doyle that was convinced that uh, that uh, Jack Jack the Ripper was basically they called him a mono, monomaniac back at the time, but a person that had a disease basically neurosyphilis. And then so uh, so that uh, but he thought that the letters, some of the Ripper letters, that's what uh, the uh, Sherlock Holmes could have used possibly to help out. Sadly, many of those, most of those letters are, are actually fakes. But uh, but it's interesting because the guy I researched, uh, the suspect is Francis Tumbley, he had the uh, neurosyphilis. Oh, and uh, Arthur Conan Doyle was making comments that the Dear Boss letter had Americanisms in it. So it was likely a, uh, a monomaniac American. And that's exactly what Francis Tumbley was. So my argument at the end with Kevin was, if uh, if he would have known who Tumbley was at the time, maybe Sherlock Holmes would have uh, battled Tumbley himself. So that was uh, my fun part of it. <laughs> Are you familiar with Doctor H. H. Holmes? Yes, and and I and uh, the problem with him was that uh, he's a Chicago serial killer. Right. That uh, uh, his great grandson, when he uh, Mudgett, uh Jeff Mudgett, when he looked at, uh, he was researching to find out if. If Holmes was in Chicago during the Ripper killings in the autumn of 1888, right. uh, and uh, he, he says he wasn't, so then uh, his great grandson said, therefore he was in across the Atlantic and killed these women. Uh, but what happened is, is he forgot to look at the voting uh, records, and, okay. and, and he, he's in the voting records. And then also, his daughter was born uh, in July of 1889, which means that he had to have conceived during the middle of the Ripper murders in Chicago because his wife never left Chicago. Unless it's not really his daughter. But uh, oh. so there's a, there's a lot of uh, a lot of misconceptions when that came about. But, yeah. yeah. <laughs> no, I've seen his name, you know, uh, considered as a, as a possibility for the Ripper. Primarily, I guess, because he was a serial killer. You know, right. No one ever takes the time. To, and then this is, you know, again, when I go back to this, I go back to the details, you know. If I were to do H.H. H. Holmes and consider him to be Jack the Ripper, believe me, I'd check the voting records. <laughs> oh, exactly, exactly. And then, uh, but that's for sure. And also the foremost expert in Holmes uh, basically says there's absolutely no evidence that Holmes ever crossed the Atlantic. That's right. But so Sherlock Holmes has gone to America then. He has. That is cool. Yeah, he, he went to Buffalo and joined an Irish secret society. Oh, and uh, I know that one because yeah. I'm in Buffalo, by the way. Okay. <laughs> and I had to deal with these Irish societies because Tumbledy was in Buffalo and he was an Irishman. <laughs> right. And then, you know, then he went back and became um, Altamont. That was his name in that story. Oh, and okay. That was the one with uh, Van Bork. Hmm. And it's the one uh, in, in one of the Rathbone movies. They take the uh, the scene and they take the actual lines from the Doyle story, and, you know, Holmes says, there's an east wind coming. Ah. You know, and that's, uh, it's, it's really well done. That particular oh. story, I think, is really well done. Did you, did you ever wonder why um, Sherlock Holmes has such a lasting power with the public, like over and over and over? I mean, it, it seems like every... A decade, we have new movies and new books and right. new versions, and it just it never seems to end. It it doesn't end, and and it's it's you know I, I guess a testament to the skill of Doyle as an author. But as you point out, you know Robert Downey Jr. has done two movies; he's doing a third. Uh, we had the Cumberbatch series, we've had the uh, the Elementary series. Uh, recent vintage, you have the Enola Holmes movies. Right. They're on uh, Netflix, I believe. Uh, and that's good. Yeah, it's very good. You, there was a series on Netflix that was not so good called The Irregulars. Uh, 
But, I mean, you go back, and, and Holmes has either been on radio and TV almost constantly since, like, the 20s and the 30s. And not only in not only in the English speaking, I mean, there was the whole Russian series. There's a Japanese series, Miss Holmes. Uh, I mean, I'm, I'm not sure why the appeal is as wide as it is, but there is definitely an appeal there. And people read Holmes and they find something that resonates with them. Yeah, and Whether it's generational, too. It is generational. You know, and I think what a lot of people who like Holmes do, and I did this to a small degree myself, is they try to, you know, interest their children in it. You know, I, I wrote a uh, an alphabet book called Bees for Baker Street. I have two small grandchildren. And... The alphabet book uh, is, you know, geared. It's only little rhymes, but hopefully, you know, my do- my granddaughter is going to be four. My grandson was just two. Hopefully, when they get a little bit older, they can kind of read it, appreciate it, and understand, you know, what Sherlock Holmes is about. So you've written quite a few of these. So how do you choose what you're going to put together and how you're going to put together one of the stories? I, you know, there are two types of writers, I'm sure you know. There are plotters and there are pantsers. Right. And I'm a pantser. I sit down and I really have just a vague notion of what I'm going to write about. One of the novels that I wrote is uh, called The Merchant of Menace. And at the heart of The Merchant of Menace uh, is a uh, Fabergé egg. And I had always had an abiding interest in Fabergé eggs. I was amazed by them. And that book allowed me to, you know, delve into the history of Fabergé eggs, their construction, where they ended up, and everything else. And a lot of that found found its way into my book. And it's just like something will strike me, and it could be the oddest thing, and that's what sets me off. I find it fascinating, the whole whole concept. Now, you've got this newest one out that it's called The the Poison Pawn. Correct. And it's Sherlock Holmes Adventure, book number 14. So let's talk about that. So what okay. what's the premise of this? Uh, without, I'm trying to hedge my bets here because I don't want to give away too much, obviously. Uh, yeah. The premise is that a young woman comes to Holmes and she says, uh, you know, my brother has disappeared. At the same time, Lestrade comes to Holmes and he says, you know, we, we found a body in the London Bridge, which was under construction at that time. And it ends up, you know, obviously her brother and the body are the same person. That comes on early in the book. But it develops into a three-dimensional game of chess, if you will, between Holmes and his unknown adversary. And, you know, at several points during the book, you know, Watson tells Holmes, you know, when you're playing chess, you know, if if you lose a pawn, you just take it off the board. You know, you lose a piece. He goes, but you're playing with lives and you're playing with people's, you know, destinies. And Holmes says, I'm I'm well aware of that. You know, so he never takes anything for granted. But that's it became a chess match because I've I've always enjoyed chess as well. that kind of grew into, uh, you know, two men literally trying to outwit each other. Have you ever thought about um, where Sherlock Holmes came from with Doyle? Like, what, where, what, if, if he was after someone else, um, created under the image of another person? Well, the general theory is that he was modeled on Bell's, uh, on uh, one of Doyle's medical school teachers, Dr. Joseph Bell. And they said, you know, one of the things that Bell would do is he would have a beaker of really foul-tasting liquid in front of the class. And he would put his finger in, you know, he would dip his finger in and then taste it. And he'd say, okay, I want you all to do the same. And each of his students would come up and he'd say, and he'd say you know, they, they would do the same thing. But what Bell did was he put his index finger into the beaker But he put his middle finger into his mouth to taste it. So he never actually tasted the stuff. And he would tell them, you see, but you do not observe, which is what Holmes is always preaching. 
you know, we, we're not paying attention. You see someone stick a, th- a finger in a, in a thing of liquid, put it in their mouth, you assume that's the finger that went into the liquid without even thinking about it. So that he's, he appears to be the model for Sherlock Holmes. The, his antagonist, uh, Professor Moriarty. Right. Uh, have you ever uh, used him or are you a, a shy away from him? Uh, I've used Moriarty. I've had henchmen who, rather than uh, try to one-up Doyle, I've had my villains in the employ of Moriarty, if you will. Oh, okay. You know, I mean, Moriarty is a great character who isn't in all that many books. I think he's only referenced in, like, four short stories. Three short stories and one novel. Hmm. And, uh, you know, the biggest story that he plays a role in is uh, the final problem, where Holmes goes to Switzerland and Moriarty follows him and they have that fight at the Reichenbach Falls. But, you know, he's, 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 he's the number one villain in the canon, you know. And I don't think, you know, it's bad enough I'm stealing Doyle's detective, but I want to steal his villain too. <laughs> Now, didn't also uh, Arthur Conan Doyle wanted to basically off Sherlock Holmes? Oh, absolutely. Hmm. He felt that his historical writings were being neglected uh, because Holmes took so much attention from him. So despite, you know, his, his mother got very angry at him. He told his mother he was going to kill his, his Holmes off. And mom didn't like it. <laughs> no, she was very upset. But he did it anyway. And then it was a situation where, you know, as the years went by, publishers just kept coming back to him and basically throwing more money at it. Speaking of that, uh, Arthur Conan Doyle, that um, at the beginning, I, wasn't it that uh, they he, he wanted to kind of not do Sherlock Holmes, so when the publisher came, he, he said it's going to be a real high level of money, and they, uh, they gave it to him. Well, that's how, he got, that's how Holmes got brought back. Holmes' origin traces to a dinner. Uh, he was at dinner, believe it or not, with Oscar Wilde, and I believe the publisher's name was George Nunez. And he commissioned Doyle and Wilde to write a story for him. And Wilde turned in a picture of Dorian Gray, Uh and Doyle turned in a study in Scarlet. (laughs) And, you know, from there he went to the short stories, because, again, he started, he was a struggling doctor. And, uh, you know, he didn't have a thriving practice by any means. So writing was a way to supplement the income. And then when Holmes took off, then he branched out into his other historical writing. And he wanted to do more of that, but they, all they wanted was Holmes. Hmm. So he killed Holmes <laughs> off, and they, they kept coming back and throwing more money and more money and more money. And then he wrote uh, The Hound of the Baskervilles, I believe. And what he did, he was smart, because he set that before Holmes perished. So this way he wasn't locked into, he hadn't actually brought him back. He had brought him back to the public, but he hadn't brought him back to life oh, yet. So that came back, and that was a success. And again, all that did was increase the demand for more home stories. <laughs> so then they came back, and they threw two more, you know, bathtubs full of money at him. And he said, okay, fine. <laughs> and I, be- I believe that at one point he was the highest paid author in the world. Did he know Bram Stoker? <laughs> I believe he did. <laughs> so how do you keep, go about keeping it fresh, keeping ideas um, that are still, uh, they still resonate with the true Sherlock Holmes and story, but, yeah, how do you keep it fresh? I think what you have to do is look for something that has not been done before, at least not by Doyle, you know. So, as I mentioned, the Fabergé egg, you know, which, you know, you know how valuable they are and what collector's items they are, you know, and that became the focal point. Uh, in the poison porn, Holmes, 
never once, to my knowledge, plays chess in in, in the canon. He doesn't play in any of the novels or any of the short stories. And yet you would think think someone like Holmes would be an excellent chess player, given the fact that he's always able to be three or four moves ahead of his opponent. And so that became almost a natural kind of uh, motif for that particular story. And in incidents, uh, the second second novel I wrote was uh, The Stone of Destiny, and that involves the Coronation Stone, or the Stone of Schoon, and it's about 360 pounds, and it sat in Westminster Abbey. It was in a chair called the Coronation Chair, and every king of Eng- queen of England would have to sit on this chair during the coronation. And then in 19, I think it was 1950, a group of uh, students broke into Westminster Abbey on Christmas Day and stole it, and eventually it was recovered, but. Uh, for the longest time, Great Britain, uh, that was their tradition. And it was a final Jeopardy question one night, the Stone of Schoon. And I remember thinking years later, you know, wouldn't it be interesting? Because, I mean, they, they raised a large hue and cry when it was stolen. Everyone was out looking for it and everything else. And I remember thinking, you know, wouldn't it be interesting if this had been stolen years earlier? And for whatever reason, the, the crown needed to keep it secret. They didn't want people to know that it had been stolen. So that's the way I structured that Holmes book. Well, that's interesting. So you just kind of come across the idea and then kind of think, well, that would be interesting. Exactly. And, but how much research, that, like when you're talking about something like that in, or like chess playing and stuff, if you're not a chess player yourself, how do you make sure that it sounds like they're having an intelligent game or do you kind of just avoid it? No, you, you, I, as I say, I, I, can, I have researched things like how fast horses can gallop, how fast they canter. Uh, I have researched the, uh, the ancient Irish alphabet system out of Ogham, O-G-H-A-M. I, you know, anything that crosses my mind. I, the, the book before this was called Three May Keep a Secret. And I remember reading about this piece of jewelry that had been made using a technique, I'd never heard of it before, called plicajour, which literally means let the daylight in. And that became the jumping off point for that book with the, the, the very valuable piece called the Marode Cup. And I began, that deals with a lot of people forging antiquities. And you know, selling them on the on the market as as real pieces. So yeah, I do. I would say if it takes me a year to write a book, six months are spent doing research and six months are spent in the actual writing. So doing fourteen of these, have you ever noticed maybe an accident that you assumed uh, some of this kind of idea came from Martha Conan Doyle, then you realized it was actually you from book three? Or something like this, that you're doing a pattern that you actually created as opposed to maybe Arthur Conan Doyle? No, I can't say I'm, I can't say I'm that clever. <laughs> <laughs> oh, come on. Just say it. <laughs> <laughs> I so wish we, I could. Yeah, and it's not that. modesty preventing me, trust me. <laughs> um, so when you finish, how, how is this? When you finish a book, right. um, what does it do for you? Like, what do you get out of doing one of these books? Uh, well, when you're finished, the first thing you get is an immediate sense of relief. Okay? And then I have a, I have a series of beta readers, uh, the toughest of which is my wife. But I, I give the book to, you know, the various beta readers for feedback. And I've been very fortunate, very, very fortunate in that, you know, I know which books of mine are stronger. I know which books are the weaker ones. And knowing that, knowing what you didn't do well in the past, kind of helps you avoid that same pitfall in the future. You know, the ability, you you can know your strengths, but you also better know your weaknesses. Right. What what, what exactly about it would make it strong, make it as opposed to weak? Like what makes a good story or a good book? Well, one of the things that 
uh, too many books, not just Sherlock Holmes books, but too many books turn on is, is the idea of coincidence, you know, and I try to avoid coincidence in any way, shape or form in my books. It just, you know, Romeo and Juliet just doesn't happen that often where, you know, he misses the fire and the fire misses him and he goes into the tomb, stabs himself and she wakes up shortly after and stabs her, you know, it doesn't work that way. You know, life doesn't turn on coincidence. Life turns on planning. And everything that Holmes does is meticulously planned. And that's that's the problem with, with my writing is that, you know, we were talking about this before, plotters and pantsers. Uh, I'll be sitting at, at the computer and I'll be writing. And I always have this phrase, wouldn't it be cool if? And then I realize that I can make whatever I think would be cool happen. The problem is then it sometimes takes me two to three weeks to solve the problem I've just created for myself. You know, once you paint yourself into a corner, it can be difficult to get out. Well, so, so what's your favorite one that you've written in, in the uh, Sherlock Holmes series? Uh, I'm kind of partial to, um, I'm partial to the porn. I'm partial to the uh, Merchant of Menace. My wife's favorite and, it generally seems to be everybody else's favorite is the back and cameos. What do, you, what do you think the difference is? Like, why why do you see it different than what a lot of people do? Uh, I think I've grown a little bit as a writer, and I, I don't think I'm making yeah. the same types of mistakes that I made in my earlier books, you know. And, I mean, there are things now, I mean, they're, they're like the first two books I wrote, uh, the point of view switched back and forth between Holmes and other characters. Uh, I don't do that anymore. The last five, Watson has been the narrator and the only narrator. And, you know, that, that's a struggle because you have to keep him in the book. You know, and he has to be with Holmes, and yet Holmes has to be the focal point. So it's a little bit of a, it's a, little bit of a tougher writing process in that respect. But I think the rewards are worth it when you get done. So you're not, uh, we're not uh, listening to Holmes at all. We're, we're listening to Watson. Well, you're listening to Holmes in, in dialogue. But I mean, Watson, okay. is, Watson is the narrator. Okay. You know, there's a lot of, obviously there's a lot of dialogue in the books. Wow. I, I, I think it's fascinating putting something like this together. So how do you know when you've got the right story? That's a that's a, a weird question, but in a sense of when you get an idea, like when you had something brewing in your mind, or you you hear something and you think about it, and you want to apply it to Sherlock Holmes, what makes it right for you? What's what what's the confidence thing? Yeah, it has to. This is it's basically a feeling, you know. I I wish I could be more specific than that, but. There are things that, you know, you, you watch a movie or you read a book and, you know, you say, yeah, that feels right. And I've, I've had, you know, false starts and I've, I've started with things that didn't work out the way I had hoped. Or I've started with things and they've gone an entirely different way than I had imagined. And that's part of it. It's, 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 it's gotta feel right. You know, as, as nebulous as that sounds, that's really the answer. Well, how about the very first book? I, I, to me, it's like, you're putting so much on your shoulder to be the author of Sherlock Holmes himself. How did that happen? How did that, that happen? Uh, <laughs> it's like, did you? Was it you that decided, or did someone ask you to do it? Or no, I, I had decided. You know, and the, the the beauty of Doyle, and this goes back to an earlier question, is you know throughout the canon, throughout his poems and uh, his short stories and novels, he's always referencing other cases that we know nothing about. Hmm. And that's where the Vatican cameos come from. That's a, a throwaway line at the beginning of The Hound of the Baskervilles. You know, he, he, Dr. Mortimer comes to, you know, call on Holmes, and he says, you know, you know, you may have seen this. And Holmes says, no, he says, I was a little bit preoccupied uh, taking care of that matter of the Vatican cameos for the Pope, so I missed several interesting English cases. Hmm. And it's a throwaway line. But that throwaway line became, okay, what can I do with that title to turn it into a book? Oh, wow. And, you know, some of the some of the throwaway lines are famous, like the giant rat of Sumatra is a throwaway line. You know, that Watson mentions, he said, you know, the world, 
uh, he said, the world is not ready yet for the tale of the giant rat of Sumatra. And bang, you know, it's a tease. Now, whether Doyle ever intended to write these in the future or not, I don't know. But there are more than a hundred uh, untold tales in the canon. You know, he mentions uh, an, an amateur mendicant society. He mentions the mysterious case of the aluminum crutch, the lighthouse, the politician, and the trained cormorant. You know, so all these things are out there. And some have been picked up and turned into pastiches by other authors. And I happen to choose the Vatican cameos for my first pastiche. Hmm. How is that? So do you get other authors fighting you over these? <laughs> no, you know, I mean, Holmes, Holmes today is, is almost, you know, you had mentioned why you stay smart. It's almost like he's a cottage industry. You know, they are probably, I would say, conservatively speaking, Somewhere between three and five hundred Holmes titles produced every year. Yeah. And that's not counting, that's just print. That's not counting fan fiction. That's not counting TV or, or movies or anything else. So, you know, if you want to just up it to five hundred and include everything, we can do that. Or, or, so are you ever going to change kind of the theme that you do? You kind of keep it back in the, in the old times. Like you don't, you have modernized yours. Um, it, it, or do you, do you ever plan on doing something wild like that? Well, what I what I I have a book in the back of my mind, and it's been in the back of my mind for uh, probably four or five years now. And uh, in college and in graduate school, I, I specialized in medieval literature. And you know, there's a lot of the medieval period that creeps into my books. Uh, so, and I have this one story from the Middle Ages that I would love to just sit down and turn it into a novel. Well, whether I will or not, that's another whole story. Because that, you know, the great thing about Holmes is the world has been created. You know, the characters are there, the setting is there, and the setting is, you know, very rich. And all you really have to do as an author is, you know, come up with a plot that works as opposed to creating an entire world. And I guess, in a way, uh, both Holmes and Watson, their personalities can be changed. Yes. Like, not, not the style of their detective and their behavior, maybe, how they work on cases, but their actual attitudes and, and feelings and things like that can actually be changed from author to author. Yes, absolutely. And again, you know, Holmes, as created by Doyle, the later stories, he's, he's a much more human, a much, I don't want to say warmer, but that's the word. He's a warmer individual than he is in the earlier stories. You know, Doyle, Watson describes Holmes as an automaton, a thinking machine. And in the later stories, that's not nearly so evident. So so you could actually do, you know, like just kind of like how they did it with uh, females, uh, Dr. Watson and stuff. You can, sure. boy, the world is open. Yeah, I mean, Holmes, you know, Holmes has been everywhere. There's, there was a cartoon series, Sherlock Holmes in the 23rd century. Uh, Holmes has, uh, there's a book out, Holmes, Sherlock Holmes and the Roswell Incident, you know. A lot of people, a lot of authors have taken him, you know, into World War II, where you know he'd kind of be in his 80s or 90s during the <laughs> World War II. So that, you know, that doesn't quite work. I mean, the World War One would be fine. You know, he'd be near the end of his career, but you know, he'd be 60. So okay, if he's a viral 60, that's fine. One interesting thing that uh, that modern researchers have uh, have a better understanding of serial killers. Of back at when I research the 19th century that they really did not have a good grasp at all of the, how the serial killers thought. Uh, do you ever kind of deal with that with uh, Sherlock Holmes or do you avoid any kind of serial killer? No, I did my second book. Uh, no, I'm sorry, the third book. Uh, the Druid of Death is a uh, serial killer book. Okay. You know, so, but... You know, it wasn't, it's not random. So, I mean, he's a very calculated, carefully planned, carefully orchestrated killings with a purpose in mind. Okay. 
It's not just, you know, random like Jack the Ripper seems to have been. Now, and, and in your murders and cases like that, you don't really get into the gore. Like in, tip, in typical Sherlock Holmes fashion, it isn't like a descriptive murder, is it? No, I, I don't. There are some authors that do, but, mm-hmm. it you know, again, you know, I'm trying to be true to Doyle yeah. and give you what purports to be a, a, a Sherlock Holmes story, you know, written by Dr. Watson. So I'm not going to deviate too far from, you know, the written records that Watson has left us. Do you guys have a group? Is there a Sherlock Holmes writers group? And do you guys do awards and magazines and all that stuff like Jack the Ripper? Well, or do you guys know? There are, there are Sherlock Holmes societies all over the United States. Uh, just about every major city has one from Los Angeles to Washington to New York. And even a lot of smaller cities have them. But the biggest Sherlock Holmes society is the Baker Street Irregulars. And that's by invitation only. You have to be invited to join that. And yeah. in the history of the Baker Street Irregulars, uh, Isaac Asimov was a Baker Street Irregular. Uh, oh, Mickey Spillane was a Baker Street Irregular. Uh, Franklin Delano Roosevelt was a Baker Street Irregular. You know, so they have this long, distinguished history going back, and they meet once a year in January in New York City uh, to celebrate Sherlock Holmes' birthday, and they have a dinner. New members are invested. Uh, you know, there's always a performance of some kind. There's a, it's an entire weekend every January dedicated to Sherlock Holmes, and people from all over the world fly in for this. I realize it's a big festive. They've never invited me. <laughs> that's what I was invited to. I've always recently begun to get invited. That's well, what I was invited to in Buffalo, because that's uh, the Buffalo Society, the one in Buffalo with uh, Kevin Gallivan. So uh, they're pretty right. dedicated. Yeah, must be. Jeez. Well, as I said, you know, there was uh, the, the one here in New York was called the Priory Scholars. Uh, I know the one in Texas is the Lone Bark. Uh, <clears throat> there's the Norwegian Explorers. They're all over. I mean, Minneapolis has a big one. Chicago has a big one. You know, and, and they do. They hold conferences. They hold symposiums every every year. Wow. That's pretty interesting. Now, um, for yourself here, do you um, like to interact with readers or fans and stuff like that? Do you have social media that you like to give out to people or a website? How do people get a hold of Richard? Well, the easiest thing, I mean, I have no problem interacting with readers. Uh, the easiest way to get hold of the books is Amazon. You know, if you search Richard T. Ryan and add the word Holmes on Amazon, you know, you'll come up with all the books. Uh, and then, you know, I'm on Goodreads, so, you know, people message me on Goodreads all the time. And, yeah, I have no problem interacting with readers at all. Enjoy hearing back from them. So now I should also mention before we go that you um – also, uh, you've done a book on Agatha Christie trivia. Uh, what, yes. what drew you to that? Well, again, I, I, I had it during the summers when I was a teenager. I had a job as a messenger in Manhattan. And a lot of my time was spent either sitting on a bench waiting to deliver something or riding the subways. And I, would, I loved mysteries. I would devour mysteries. And at that time, you know, you could get a book for a dollar. And I would, you know. I would buy a book every morning for a dollar, and, uh, you know, I'd have it done by the time I got home because I had to commute in from Staten Island to Manhattan and then back to Staten Island. So I became an avid reader. I had John Dixon Carr, uh, Agatha Christie, people like that. I just read them constantly, which probably explains why I'm still fascinated by Holmes. Ellery Queen. Ellery Queen. Yeah, the golden age of mystery. Thing. I think it's uh, much more interesting than modern-day uh, detective mysteries, but th- that's me. I don't know. Do you, do you enjoy new new stuff out there? Well, my, I, I, love the, I love the Jack Reacher character by Lee Child. Yeah. I think that's very, very well done. Uh, my other favorite authors include Stephen Hunter, uh, Daniel De Silva. Uh, Daniel Silva, I'm sorry, no doubt. Daniel Silva, and uh, Kyle Mills, who writes the Mitch Rapp series. Now, those, are, those are people that I actually look forward to reading 
wait for their books every year. Do you find a difference between um, British mystery detectives as opposed to American? Oh, absolutely. <laughs> what, well, I, this is, I ask um, quite often, and I get usually people that say, yeah, and they'll say their feeling on the two types of mystery writing. But the, I also get about 30% of writers that say no, they're the same. So it always that always fascinates me. I wait for that answer where they say no, I don't know, it's the same, and it's not, but that's okay. What what what's your take on the two? What's the big difference? Well, I think you know, with, with the biggest difference is you know you, you have this. I have this image in the back of my mind of you. You don't see the British detectives, you know, going into any place guns blazing, you know. Whereas, you know, American detectives, that seems to be one of their, one of their fortes. You know, you, you think of something like Die Hard with John McClane, who's really a detective, right? Yeah. And then you compare it to something like, uh, the, the Helen Mirren series, uh, suspect, uh, prime suspect. You know, and again, like John Luther, again, with, uh, Idris Elba, you know, He's kind of a Sherlock Holmes character, you know, and it, there's a there's a difference in the way they approach their mysteries. There's a certain gentility to the British characters that Americans don't have. There's also something I noticed. You, it's not as dramatic. Um, well, that's not the right word, but but you could take a Sherlock Holmes. You'll learn what you need to about the characters but it's not so drawn out. I find a lot of American mystery detective shows, especially, it gets too, um, it's too, too much drama in it. There's way too much stuff going on about the characters, like more than you need to know, and it, it almost takes away from the mystery. Well, I think with American, you know, it, it's, what you, it sounds almost like red herrings, and how do you handle red herrings, you know, and... If they're necessary, but you, you can overdo it. You can throw in all kinds of distractions, and those distractions can be character-based, they can be plot-based, they can be setting-based, whatever it may happen to be. But, you know, the British seem a little bit more straightforward in how they approach things than the Americans do. You know, more, much more linear, let me put it that way. Yeah, yeah. So would you mean something like uh, one of the authors that I interviewed with Al talked about usually his characters have some kind of flaw and then he really works that flaw into that character right you say something like that where it's, they go too far with the flaw or something they can sure you, you know you can carry anything too far and you know i mean there are books that i've started you know that i thought you know come highly recommended i just can't finish and yeah. overwhelmingly those books are written by american authors yeah yeah, there's too much sometimes. Um, you know, I get, I, I, you get carried away with, it, it takes the focus away. Um, it takes the tension away, the suspense away right. from the actual mystery. If there's too much fluff about the characters, especially the extra characters that really don't matter, you know. But uh, anyway, that's just... Uh, well, that goes back. That goes back to one of the things I said earlier, with Doyle being this, you know, the economical writer, and doing in two sentences what other para other authors take two paragraphs, and maybe in some cases two pages to do. Yeah, because there's always that. You know, it's it, it, to me that's what's an amazing writer or a great writer is someone that, you know, they can write a paragraph and you just look at it and you go, God, I wish I could write that. You know what I mean? Like it just it I do so believe me, I do so little that you're like, Wow, that's insane and I want to do that. Yeah. And of course I never do, but <laughs> <laughs> very few of us do. But that's all right. That's all right. We well we no, Michael Hawley does. He does. <laughs> well, speaking of that, okay. one of my fiction novels, I have my protagonist and the antagonist, they are in like a chess game and my old, my nephew, who's uh, you know in his forties, just loved it until at the end I I blew everything up. 
<laughs> so I went back to America and I blew it all up. And so he goes, and I loved it. It was my favorite book until you blew everything up. <laughs> yeah. Oh, well. <laughs> it was all good until then. Well. That's right. Well, I really appreciate you coming on. It's been. Uh, oh, I really appreciate you having me. It's it's always fascinating talking to other authors and finding out stuff and kind of how they do things right. and get some good conversations. So, the newest book, of course, is called The Poisoned Pawn, right. Sherlock Holmes Adventure, and the writer has been our guest. I want to thank you, thank you, uh, Richard T. Ryan. Michael, it was a pleasure meeting you. Oh, you as well. It was great. You've been listening to the House of Mystery radio show. To find out more about our guests, hosts, or shows, go to www.houseofmystery.com. Show's over for now. Was it as good for you as it was for me? Yeah. Good night. This is the production of Something Weird Media. I'll be back. You've been listening to the House of Mystery radio show. To find out more about our guests, hosts, or shows, go to www.houseofmystery.com. Show's over for now. Was it as good for you as it was for me? Well, good night. This has been a production of Something Weird Media. I'll be back.